So if you're listening in, uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. We're going to look at this and start off with this scripture tonight. That if we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Notice this, Brother Monty, is talking about, Paul's talking about, carried about with every wind of doctrine that comes down the road. Have you ever seen a time that there's so much false doctrine that it's difficult for the average person just starting out in the faith to discern what's right? Uh, and especially if you get on the social media, uh, mm. it, people that haven't even mm. read the Bible are giving yeah. their opinions on what Scripture says, mm. so... Yeah, they're, they're, there's false doctrine everywhere. Well, they get into philosophy and uh, what I call individual theology. I'll interpret what's good for me. And there's no private interpretation. It's the same for everyone. And so, we need to be careful about the false doctrine that's coming down the road because it'll lead you astray. And actually, I, I made a statement last Wednesday night that going to the wrong church could kill you. It's a slow thing. It leavens up, and then you find yourself out in the world, backslid, away from God. Because demons ride in on false doctrine, isn't that right? Yes, they do. So we've got to guard against that. And that's one responsibility of elders and pastors is to guard against false doctrine because it leads the sheep astray. And we care more about keeping the sheep right with God than what people might think. It's what the Lord says. And the, Paul warned us about preachers that are hirelings and mm -hmm. that are wolves in sheep clothing. Yeah. Yeah, and they tell people what they want them to, what they want to hear, and uh, they're labeled as as good ministers, but then there's no growth. No. So we need to be challenged to change. So let's look at First Corinthians three ten. If you want to turn over there tonight. Amen. So. When we are endeavoring to discern what's right and wrong, what's true and not true, first off, there are many truths uh, in the in the word in the world, but like pi r square. And Grandma said, "Cornbread or square, <laughs> <laughs> pi r round." Well, it's but anyway, there are many truths, but only one real truth. That's right. And Pilate asked the question, "What is truth?" So he had, he had truth standing right there. The Lord Jesus himself is the divine embodiment of truth. So when, Paul, when Saul was called to be Paul the Apostle, he was given certain revelations that were known a little bit in the Old Testament, but uh, expanded in the New, and he was given the ultimate revelation. If you want to read uh, verse 14, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 3.10, please. I get it right. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, mm -hmm. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Amen. We understand that, but mo many people do not understand that. They don't know what the foundation is. And then what we've experienced overseas is that people will come and, and try to build on the foundation that we have laid, and then they pervert the actual foundation. Yeah. They, uh, well, they, they, they actually tear down some of what we've yeah. laid. They distort the revelation. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, the apostle, now first off, let's talk a minute about foundational apostles. The way I understand it, uh, there are no more foundational apostles. Had the original 12, that was, that was it. And then Paul came along and laid the foundation. Yeah. Now, there are other apostles, of course, that, that build on their foundation, which is Christ. So I don't see any more revelation coming other than what, from the Word of God than what we have, the Word of God. But we have the foundation laid in the Word of God by the yeah. Apostle Paul. Yeah, he called it the doctrine of Christ. That's right. Uh, him, the other apostle, mm -hmm. original apostles, and Jesus, they mm -hmm. laid down the doctrine of Christ, and, and everything has to agree with that. And if it don't, it's wrong. Exactly. So that's how we know. But what is the doctrine of Christ? Uh, first off, Christ is the foundation. And uh, mm -hmm. 
That means uh, his crucifixion is involved and also his blood is really the, the, the principle, the main doctrine of the crucifixion because he had to shed his blood or there would be no forgiveness of sins. Right, and that's what the whole yeah. Old Testament pointed to was the sacrifice mm -hmm. that he would make on the cross. And then Paul uh, certainly built upon that. So we, we, we must preach the same doctrine that the Apostle Paul preached. And, and I ask you, you've been in the ministry and been saved 42 years or thereabouts. How many do you think, uh, from your perspective, are actually preaching the doctrine of Christ in the in New Testament church? I, I think it's, uh, it's pretty poor showing. I, I think... Uh, uh, there may be some preaching the basic doctrines that we'll get into here later, but uh, a lot of them aren't even doing that. They're teaching a feel-good motivational message. And bypass the foundation. Yeah. But there is no other foundation than what we're going to talk about tonight. No. And so it's sinking sand mm -hmm. when it's all said and done. And that's dangerous. That church will kill you. Yeah. So we, we've got to be sure we're hearing from the Lord, and wherever God puts you under New Testament ministry, you stay there and support that. Yeah, it's very important yeah. to, to pray about where you go to church. You, know, <laughs> you shouldn't choose a church because of, you know... No, building or... Yeah, the way prison. the building looks or the programs they have for the children. You should pr yeah. choose a church based on a lot of prayer and where, where, uh, where mm -hmm. the God through the Holy Spirit tells you to go. That's right. Well, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, we're going to go... Uh, through about a half a dozen scriptures here tonight and discuss them a little bit in Ephesians 2.20. If you got that one, we'll take a peek at that. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay. So he is the foundation. Yep. And then they plainly said that they built upon that foundation. Mm-hmm. Now, the chief cornerstone, you're a surveyor, so what do, you, what do you think that means, cornerstone? Well, if that first cornerstone's laid in crooked, the oh, whole okay. building's going to be off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Sideways. <laughs> well, so is the cornerstone, my thinking is uh, it holds all the weight. Yeah. But another way to look at it, as we uh, studied the Great Pyramid for many months, the capstone was also called a cornerstone. Mm -hmm. it, it so finished. he's at the top. So he he's the foundation. He's also the head. Yeah. So it's all him. And we're in the body of Christ in the middle. Right. So Paul gave us that revelation there that we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And so they their foundation that they laid was Jesus. Yes. And the gospel... Of course, Paul told us exactly what the gospel was in the condensed form in, in 1 Corinthians 15. But to re-emphasize again that the foundation is Christ and the cross. I've been thinking about that how long, I, that me personally, that I've been uh, teaching and preaching the cross probably uh, as a major subject 15 years. Yeah, You think about long. it. You think about it. About maybe at the same time some others started preaching it. and uh, But that is the gospel. And Without after, that, then there's nothing left. And after that, after 15 years, you've not exhausted the message. No, you didn't scratch the surface. No, no huh? <laughs> so the Bible's endless. Um, but it's the cross and the apostles and prophets. Uh, are, they were the leaders of the first church. And, and believe it or not, they still are today. Yeah, They're just not foundational. Uh, without the ministry of apostles and prophets, uh, you're going to go sideways in a church. And, and the sad yeah. thing is most, most uh, churches, congregations, uh, they're not even taught about the fivefold ministry. A lot of them yeah. claim that the uh, apostles and prophets have passed away. And, yeah, and, done away with. Yeah. So is the power of God, gives the Spirit, so it's, no more tongues. So if you do away with all that, you don't have much left, and, and what least, you got? at least you don't have any power left. No, just a form. Yeah. And you know what Paul said about that? Mm -hmm. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power from thereof sets turn away. How many turns away? Not very many. No. 
But God requires it once the light comes. Yeah. So we're to turn away from people that deny the power of God. That, that's, that's a fact. And that really is a commandment. That's one of the commands. So Christ then holds us all together. I'm glad He's the cornerstone and not the local pastor. Because we can't hold it. Get out of here, people! <laughs> we can't hold anybody together. I mean, I've tried to run after people and get them to stay in church, and you're wasting your time. No. They make their mind up before they go. Once they get a burr under their saddle, there's no <laughs> turning them back. Yeah, we, we call it here in Missouri getting something stuck on their craw like yeah. a chicken, you know. And the, really, it's nothing. It's a blowed up nothing. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. But Satan uses that carnality to get people out of the faith. Yeah. Sad to say. Well, let's go to 2 John 1, 9 and 10. We've got five and amen corner that are smirking here, so we need to get an amen every now and then out of you. Amen. Uh, it's too late to change me, people, so, you know, <laughs> I've been in this thing over 35 years, so... Second John 1, starting at verse 9. You know, remember Popeye in the cartoon? Yeah. I am what I am, and that's all I am. That's what he's... <laughs> Need a little corn cob pie. No smoking. No, we can't do that. <laughs> all right, Second John uh, 1, 9, please. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come, verse 10, if there come mm -hmm. any of, unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. That's plain, is it not? It is. But how many people, well, you know, God loves. Yeah, certainly God loves, but then um, there's a certain plumb line here. So what happens if a person does not have the doctrine of Christ? First off, they're departed from the cross and the foundational doctrine to start with. Yeah. So they're what's in, left? They're in the air. And it, it goes downhill. Truthfully, if they depart from the foundational doctrines, the doctrine of Christ, they've forsaken the Lord. And I know that's strong. They have. But then God accepts no other. It's, you know, they become a whited sepulcher. Mm -hmm. They look good on the inside, outside. They have all the form. Mm -hmm. Uh, of, of, a, of a good church, but, uh, but... Our believer. Yeah. They say they're believers, yeah. Yeah, but inside they're, they're full of error and false doctrine. That's right. So here's the challenge uh, for those who are listening. Uh, we must remain in the doctrine of Christ, which means the cross, and also uh, it's the believer's foundation. So when a, a sinner gets saved... Uh, they, they anchor in the doctrine of Christ. Right. And we remain saved by the same way. Mm -hmm. Anchored. He's the foundation. Doesn't matter what happens. He's still Lord. And yep. uh, we, we're not going to deny Him. No, we can't. Well, they say if we yeah. don't stay, abide in the doctrine of Christ, we have not God. So. Well, let me ask you a question then, and maybe the Amen Corner can say yay or nay here. Uh, if a person is born again and saved... Then they go back, uh, backslide to the point they deny Christ and the cross and leave the doctrine of Christ. Are they still saved? How many says no? I believe they can lose their salvation if they go Well, that what's far. the word say? See, we have our opinions. Our opinions don't mean anything. No. What does the word say? And we're going to get to Hebrews yeah. 6 here shortly. And like you said, most believers don't even know what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. They have no idea. So that lets me know that new converts can read the Bible, if they read the Bible, and they won't understand unless someone teaches them. Right. That, that's why God, Jesus, set the fivefold ministry in the church mm -hmm. to, to perfect the saints and bring them into unity of the doctrine. Yes, that's right. You know, it seems to me if people... Uh, reject the doctrine of Christ or forsake it, they're still lost. Yeah. So that, it cannot be once saved, always saved, even though it should be. And it, it, it can be, but you have to remain in Christ. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. And if we stray from the doctrine of Christ, which is the gospel, primarily the cross and the blood that He shed on the cross, uh, then we've forsaken the gospel. And so right. what, what good is the church? 
Now, if they're, if they're uh, not teaching the doctrine of Christ, then they're no good at all. Well, we, they get off into, what we call it, philosophy. Uh, vain philosophy, the Bible calls it mm -hmm. sometimes. They get off into tradition. Yeah, tradition makes the Word of God to no effect. Works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they get off into works. And, say, and think that they're still okay with God because of the works. And the Lord cannot accept any works if the foundation's off. That's the point we're trying that's, to make tonight. That's true. So, let's go over to Hebrews 6, uh, 1 and 2, and this is going to be it for tonight. Uh, we'll discuss this some, and I realize there's, there's different ways to look at this. So, we might uh, take a peek at, at different viewpoints. But the first thing I want to say is that Paul was right into Hebrews. Uh, that's why it's called Hebrews. Right. And uh, he was addressing some of the Old Testament uh, ways, mm -hmm. precepts and commandments and statutes, etc., etc., offerings. And uh, so he was endeavoring to, to uh, exhort them to switch over to the doctrine of Christ because right. they had strayed. And... The truth is, most of the writings of the Apostle Paul was written to correct the church. Mm -hmm. And that lets us know that we can get off as a church. Yep. So that's why we have the Word of God to make sure that we're, we're going the right way and remain on the straight and narrow. So the first verse then, please, Brother Money, tonight. Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, yes, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Okay, let's stop there. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. That's confusing because we're not, that, that is the foundation. Yeah, these, I mean, he's talking about the basic doctrines, the primary, you know, mm -hmm. like if we were in so, school, this would be the first grade course. So he's not saying we're, we're to throw them aside. No, he's saying that we're going to, Build on them. Build on them. Exactly. We're going to, we've got the foundation laid, now we're going to build on that. We're going to go on. Mm. But a casual reading, oh well, you know, it doesn't matter. Leave it. And no. Sometimes English, there's no words really to accurately define Greek. We have to do some studying. That word laying, it's, it's the uh, Greek katabala, which means to throw okay. down, like you'd throw a ball down. Okay. Um, so some of the... Some of the uh, theologians think that perhaps he's saying don't tear down the foundation mm -hmm. of these basic doctrines. Mm -hmm. I see no harm with that, do you? Yeah, I, I think it makes sense. Well, but, but the point I want to start off with here is that Paul was uh, warning the, the Jewish believers to not go back into Judaism or law-keeping. Right. That's the point. Because he's addressing things here that happened in the Old Testament. Right. And we can liken it to New Testament, and we certainly can do it that way, but there's a double meaning here in a lot of these scriptures, a lot mm -hmm. of these words. But apparently, people were the same problem. They were, they were phasing back into law-keeping. And, you know, I'm not positive about this, but uh, if I remember right, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. Yeah. And that's when the sacrifices stopped. Mm-hmm. So can you, can you imagine after Christ dying, you know, uh, 30, 33 A.D. or thereabouts, another two or three decades of, of continual uh, sacrifices, what blasphemed that is? Yeah, I mean, he fulfilled the symbology of those sacrifices, and they completely mm -hmm. overlooked that and put more emphasis on, on the sacrifices Mm -hmm. than they did on, on what they meant. And so they wouldn't stop the sacrifices. Uh, and so God had to allow Israel to, to go down. Yeah. Then the, the sacrifices stopped. Yeah, he allowed, for the sure, for sure. <laughs> he allowed the temple to be destroyed and mm -hmm. they stopped it. Yeah, and the temple needs to be rebuilt again. Well, all right, so... Many Christian Jews want, would go back to the sacrificial system. And as Brother Moni said, that was fulfilled in Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Now, why would a person want to do that if they were actually born again? And I think some of these people were. I think it's just the natural tendency of the flesh. They want to do something. The flesh mm -hmm. wants to do something to earn that mm -hmm. salvation. And, or and, to keep it. Or to keep it. Same thing. And, and uh, you know, the flesh is not spiritual at all, so it doesn't, you know, we can understand in our mind what's happened to our mm -hmm. spirit when we got born again, and but, but yeah. our flesh is just stubborn, carnal. Well, it, it's enmity against spiritual things, yeah. and it has to be crucified, of course. So the doctrine of Christ, that, that's a given. We understand that. Then it's gone to perfection. Maybe that could be completion. I don't mm -hmm. think a person is complete until they're, they're well balanced in all the Scripture, not just one doctrine. Right. And that's the, the burden, responsibility, and the privilege of the church, ministry in the church, is to teach people these truths. And when these truths are received in faith, the Holy Spirit's activated, and then we have the power of God moving. That's the way right. it works. The flesh can't make that happen. It's no. spiritual. So then, uh, the foundation of repentance from dead works. Uh, what do you think dead works would be? Well... I think a lot of people interpret this as they see repentance and they automatically think sin, but yeah, he's he's writing to work. he's writing mm -hmm. to Christians, so mm -hmm. they've already repented from sin and turned mm -hmm. from it and been born again. The dead works is uh I believe it's any work that the Lord didn't tell you to do. Yeah, or also a, a maybe a needful work that but your faith, you're, you're, you're thinking this is going to please God and I'm going to get favor with God because I'm doing this. And we already have favor with God. Well, another scripture says anything that is not of faith is sin. sin. So if we're doing these uh, works yeah. and we're not doing yeah. them in faith, that'd be a then dead it'd work. It'd be a dead work. So when the judgment comes, in, it'll be burned up. And but the Christian will be saved so as by fire is what the Bible teaches us. You know, in the, in the time I've been uh, mm -hmm. saved... Mm -hmm. These forty some years, yeah, I've seen where uh, the Lord will tell a pastor to do something that's not been done in the community before. Mm -hmm. and it'll work. It'll work, and then the other pastors will say, "Hey, that worked for him. It'll hey, work yeah. for us." But God didn't uh, tell them to do it. It won't work. Huh? So they're doing the exact same thing for the one that the Lord told to do it. It's a good work, and for mm -hmm. the copycats, it's mm -hmm. just dead work. And it's I've like, noticed yeah. they have trouble in their churches, too. When they oh, yeah, that. terrible. <laughs> Satan gets in. Yeah. Well, it's like this little live stream that we, we're doing on Wednesday night. Uh, several have told me, well, that's not the norm. I understand that. Uh, you have church services on Sunday. You don't need church services all the time, uh, music and strobe lights and everything. Uh, what we need is foundational teachings and preachings of the Word of God. That's, right. what, we, that's what people really need. Not anything else. No. It's that simple. And yet religion complicates this thing where the people are so confused they give up. And then if they pick up on half-truths and begin to teach that, then we're really getting into problems. Yeah. And then the sheep go astray. And then we, that's, so we've got to guard against that. Uh, so what I want to say about this dead works and faith toward God, well, they had faith toward God, but it was in the Old Testament sacrifice. That Old Testament sacrifice represented the one that would come. Mm -hmm. And they had to believe that. It wasn't just doing to be doing. Right. And if they didn't believe that, God wouldn't accept them. And, and their sins uh, would not be covered. It's a serious thing. Mm -hmm. So and, we... And there's go a, ahead. You know, in the Old Testament, God said, I'd rather have obedience than sacrifice. Yeah, he got so, tired of the sacrifices. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we cannot have faith toward God under law keeping. Now I need to make that clear. Well, what makes you right? Well, you got a Bible, you study, and you'll find out that it's correct. Uh, for example, in Galatians 5 4, let's turn over there tonight. As we're, I guess we're through with the first verse, unless you want to come back and make some more statements here about it. Uh, this is straightforward and right to the point, and that's what the foundational apostle do, does and did. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now, we didn't talk about that a while. Well, doesn't sound like once saved, always saved to me, if you can mm -hmm. fall from grace. Well, and, and what, 
but people think, well, they're not lost. Well, well, wait. Um, let's look at it now. Christ has become of no effect. No effect at all. <laughs> That's serious because it, it's not applicable to that person's life. It's only through the effect of, of what he accomplished on the cross that we can be saved to start with. And the gospel. Yeah. They've forsaken the doctrine of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's how you fall from grace is forsake the doctrine of Christ. And yet, in America, a lot of ministers say that, well, we've got to get rid of doctrine. No, it's the other way. Well, we were in that group here several years ago that yeah, uh, they were going to tear down the them? walls. <laughs> they were going to tear down the walls. And, Let the walls and fall down. It turned mm -hmm. out that the walls they were talking Ooh. about was doctrine. Not, not, That's right. Not differences in division, but, but doctrine. That's and, right. We couldn't go with taking. Getting well, rid they of don't doctrine. didn't understand the difference between doctrine and denominations. Right. We should have let the denominational walls fall down. I agree with that. I, that's what I thought it was going yeah, into. But it was deceptive. Yeah. The push was uh, back in that day, and still is on today. Everybody, that if we'll get rid of doctrine, it causes trouble. Then we can have unity. Mm-hmm. Have a big worldwide and, uh, church. That's wrong. <laughs> There'll be no unity without proper doctrine, yeah. proper truth. It just falls under that ecumenical movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's very, it's very deceptive. Mm -hmm. And uh, not everyone agrees with what we just said, but we better look at the Bible again. Let's read it now. See, it's not our opinion. It's what the Word of God says. Christ has, be has become. Now, He was mm -hmm. effective. Yeah. We didn't talk about this. He was affected, so they were saved. Right. Born again. Name in the book. Mm -hmm. But Christ became of no effect because they, they thought they could be justified by law keeping. And Paul said, you've fallen from grace. Now that's serious. And we're saved by grace. Through, through faith. faith. That's right. So if you've fallen from grace, where's your salvation? There's no foundation. Mm. So... Those people like that, God forbid, are in the same boat as a sinner. Yeah. Maybe worse. Well, they've known the way. So this is why Paul was writing in Hebrews and a lot of, a lot of his uh, epistles. is because Christians were going under law. And I might say, if we today go under any law, we're in danger of falling from grace. Yeah, whether it's Old Testament law or some rule we make up. Same thing. I mean, yeah. if you begin to trust in that for justification, you fall from grace. Mm -hmm. Do we understand that, everybody? Mm -hmm. I think we do here at the church. But I don't know about out there. I don't think so. Yes. So, Romans 8, 3. When Paul says that, that Christ had become of no effect, in other words, his finished work does not apply to them anymore. Now that, that lets me know they're lost. Yeah. That's serious. That's about as simple as, as you can state it. And yet, we don't, people that are in that condition, God forbid. Now, you can repent and come back, but you're going to have to accept the doctrine of Christ mm -hmm. and repent of everything else that you're putting your faith in, period. Yeah. You can ask people, we're going to have a baptized on this Sunday, Lord willing, and uh, you can ask them on the street, are you saved? Do you know the Lord? Oh, yeah. Well, how do you know? Well, I was baptized. Uh, what else? I've joined the church. Uh, let's see, what else do they, they say? Uh, I was uh, raised in a Christian home. Yeah. Me and the man upstairs, we got it worked out. <laughs> Me and the good Lord. <laughs> no, they, they don't have it worked out. Got it worked out in our own way, in my own way. Here. Yeah, I'll decide what's right. There's no, there's no way other than, than no. Jesus Christ. There's only one way. We sing that song here at the church, one way. It's true. Romans 8, 3. Let's take a peek at that right quick. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, mm -hmm. God, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, yeah. condemned sin in the flesh. Okay, what the law could not do. That's the point. Yeah, the law couldn't do it. Jesus took on flesh and did it. He accomplished it. And He it. fulfilled the, what, the requirements for yeah. salvation for us, eternal life. So why would a Christian... Uh, think that they have to go back to law-keeping when the law couldn't save them to start with. 
I think a lot of it boils down to this is not taught in churches enough. Well, you know what really happens when we really get down to what the gospel it really means? It's out of our hands, everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We're all in the same, yeah. nothing, same boat here. Nothing we can do. The only thing uh, we can do is trust believe, God. Believe. Believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are those who say, well, now, preacher, I believe. Oh, well, well where's the evidence? What could be some evidence of true believing in the doctrine of Christ? What do you think? Well, we'd have fruit. Okay. We'd have fruit of the Spirit. We'd have uh, another fruit. So we'd be leading others to Christ. Witnessing? Witnessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I think uh, not for salvation or to add to salvation, but church attendance is very important. Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd start obeying uh, God's Word. Not for saving, Gladly. assembling of ourselves, yeah. loving one another. Amen. What about uh, tithing? Tithes and offerings, you think that might be? I think that... Uh, now, you, you would do it pretty good until you got on that, right? Well, there's, there's a verse that says Jesus still receives the tithe, so if he still mm -hmm. receives it, mm -hmm. he must expect us to bring it. Yeah. Well, there's a certain blessing upon the believers that, that do tithe. Yeah. I'm not saying that tithing uh, adds to your salvation, no. No. But it might hinder. It definitely will hinder your walk with God because a curse comes. Now I don't know exactly what the curse is in Malachi, but I, I think it's just the ways of the world crash in, and uh, you don't really get the breaks of uh, faith. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the when, you, when you're curse, blessed of when you're being blessed of God. Uh, mm hmm it's just easier yeah. to walk the Christian walk. Well, you give him control. Yeah. And uh, But all these subjects that we deal with in the church is, is really the foundational doctrine of Christ. It's just linked to Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. So let's look at verse 2 then uh, of Hebrews 6, please, tonight. This will be close to the end of this little live stream. Okay, so okay. we he mentioned repentance from dead works and faith mm -hmm. toward God. Mm -hmm. So in verse 2, he gets into four more of these basic doctrines. Mm -hmm. uh, of the doctrine of baptisms, mm -hmm. and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Mm -hmm. Well, we made the statement a while ago that Paul's dealing with Jews going back into the law keeping, and they also... Uh, they knew about the certain washings and offerings and things in the Old Testament. That is true. But in the New Covenant here, as Gentiles, we, we think about, as you know, uh, the, the word baptisms. Right. Primarily, it's talking about the washings of Judaism, and we're not, we're not in that. We're Gentiles, and we're not going to go into it, and Jews that are saved better not go back into it. Right. That's been laid, that's fulfilled in Christ, and we, that's part of the foundation. But there are three baptisms that we talk about quite a bit. I remember last time we were in, uh, what was it, Zambia? Who was with me? Was you, was you with me or Billy? Uh, it's been so many times, but uh, we're on the radio. And so we just spoke about 20 minutes or so about the three different baptisms in the, in the Scripture. And then uh, they begin to call in and questions, and you know, we would answer them. And... That really sparked the radio ministry in Zambia, and now it gets big. So that, nobody's taught that. So tell us uh, briefly what the three baptisms are, Brother Money, well, in the Scripture. The first baptism is when the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. That's when you're born right. again. Mm -hmm. No water involved. No. Uh, then after that... Uh, Another Christian can baptize you into water. Well, actually, it's a minister. Minister. Okay. Another minister can baptize you into water, which mm -hmm. is symbolic of what happened when the Holy Spirit baptized you into Christ. It symbolizes Amen. the the death and resurrection of your old man yeah. into a new life. Right. So that old man then, the old nature is unplugged. Yep. It's like... Uh, a radio or something you got plugged in and you unplug the thing and it, it's it's there mm -hmm. but it's it's dormant it's uh, right. not effective 
right? Okay, good. That's and then, the second one. Then the third one is Jesus baptizing you into the Holy Spirit. That's baptism mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, then along with that come the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, most normally evidenced by speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. Acts uh, 2 4. Mm -hmm. So, so it, and if you pay attention to who's getting baptized, who's doing the baptizing, and what you're getting baptized into, it's real easy to mm -hmm. keep straight. Mm -hmm. If the Holy Spirit is baptizing the sinner into Christ, that's salvation. If a minister is baptizing a saved person into yeah, water, a saved person, right? And then you have Jesus mm -hmm. baptizing a saved person into the Holy Spirit. Yeah, or with the Holy Spirit, yeah. we call it sometimes. Which yeah. that's for power, not right. for salvation. So right. there's two, there's two uh, operations of grace here: mm -hmm. salvation and being filled, or, or uh, with the Holy Ghost. Uh, for service, mm -hmm. two different things. Same spirit, though. Yeah, I mean, the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is comes to dwell in you at salvation, but mm -hmm. that's not being baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, and and, and right. a lot, that gets mixed up a lot. Some people say, "Well, you know, you got mm -hmm. you got everything at salvation." Mm -mm. But but Paul asked, "Have mm -mm. you received the Holy Spirit since you believed?" Acts nineteen, yes. So uh, so it's two separate deals, and other yeah. people take it get carried away too far the other direction, say, well, you aren't saved until you got baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, that's Pentecostal, false too. yes, yes, it's both so, wrong, yeah. So, they mean well, but yeah. you can mean well and be wrong, you know. It's just we rightly divide the yeah. Word of God, mm -hmm. and like I said, pay attention to who's getting baptized, who's doing the baptizing, mm -hmm. what you're getting baptized into, and it's just yeah. simple and straightforward. Right, but it's all mixed up in the, in the modern-day church. Uh, there are those that teach, well, when you get saved, you got filled at the same time. Uh, no, uh, Jesus said there in John, St. John, that the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Right. So the blood has to be applied, mm -hmm. which is the cross and salvation, which is the doctrine of Christ, the beginning of it. And then it goes on through. Right. Now, water baptism uh, is not a sprinkling thing. No. The, the word baptize means to immerse. To All dump, the way down. To dip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember uh, when we were in Zambia last time, there was about 40, over 40 people that wanted to be baptized. That's the first church service I've been in overseas where everybody, standing room only, was all filled with the Holy Ghost, every one of them. All over the floor, just holy roller, you know. And uh, that's the way it should be. And I asked them how many wanted to be baptized, and uh, about 40 of them raised their hands. So we, we took a little journey down to the stream. Didn't take long to get there, you know. <laughs> Hour. It wasn't far. <laughs> Hot hour to get there, and they run the snakes out. And then, of course, uh, God sent me not to baptize, so I had Will help the little pastor there. And uh, about halfway through the baptismal candidates, uh, they were getting a little lazy, and the arm wasn't getting ducked. You know, the arm wasn't going all the way down. I said, no. Do him again and get the arm all the way down because you can't be half dead, right? <laughs> we laugh about it, but yeah. immersion is all the way under. You don't leave someone's arm out when you bury him. <laughs> Our foot, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter whether it's face first, upside down, backwards, squat. It doesn't matter. Just so people understand what it means. Yeah. It means death, burial, and resurrection. We're back to the doctrine of Christ again. Mm -hmm. Symbolize that old man, mm -hmm. the flesh, yeah. and the old man uh, yeah. being crucified with Christ, rising in newness of life. Amen. That's what it symbolizes. Of course, the newness of life starts at the new birth, not being filled with the Holy Ghost. Right. Amen. Excuse me. So all these churches seem to stray from truth. And I don't know if it's just the flesh or it's religion or actually demons are behind it trying to pervert the Word of God. Yeah. Did God really say? Did He really mean that? Is that what that means? Yeah. Well, the Bible's literal, is it not? It is. So and we need to take it literal. And where it's symbolic, there's literal meaning behind it. Always. So those three baptisms uh, are very important and uh, it helps us understand then the laying on of hands. Now, you think about the Old Testament there. Uh, 
you know, they'd bring a scapegoat, they'd bring a, a lamb, and the, the priest would lay hands and, and confess the sins. So Paul's referring back to that. But also, because Christ was our lamb, uh, and actually the Father God put our sins on him, on the cross, he was the lamb. But now in the church ministry, we have what we call the, the laying on of hands or the presbytery or whatever. You want to explain that a little bit? Well, uh, when we pray for people, lay hands on them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a point of contact. The power of the Holy Spirit can flow into them. Mm -hmm. it, not anything to do with our hands. It's just an act of faith, an act of mm -hmm. obedience. Uh, mm -hmm. And the anointing is passed on. Mm -hmm. uh, when someone is called into the ministry and, and they're officially... You know, yeah, the laying on of hands. Laying yeah. on of hands for that. So. I think it was Bishop Fred Siami uh, they watched in Zambia, and he told me the other day that uh, when the laying on of hands was, uh, when he experienced that, I should say, he says it's still going on. It's still. So it doesn't end just because we leave. Right. It keeps going, and they they understand that something tangible remains mm -hmm. and uh, it's the anointing it's what it is the anointing the Holy yeah. Spirit it's like the mantle's dropped off or something to that effect anyway alright so the laying on of hands uh, uh, what is it uh, I think it's Mark 16 16 let's take a peek at that I don't have a note here but uh, I think it's the lay hands on the sick the shall recover is that it yes they that believe we get it right here. Yeah, starting in uh, Mark 16, verse 16. I'll read yeah. a few verses okay. here. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth mm -hmm. not shall be damned. And these mm -hmm. signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. There it is. So, so it's for us today. Yes, it is. To lay hands on the sick. And James talks about uh, the elders laying hands and anointing with oil over the sick person, yeah. which uh, helps me understand that actually the sick person needs to submit to the authority, and that's faith. Mm -hmm. it, it's God's it's, working to the Spirit. It's not man at all. It, it's a combination of, of, mm -hmm. of submission and faith and obedience. obedience. Yes, right. Yeah. And trust. Yeah. It's simple things. We're talking about doctrine of Christ, aren't we? Mm -hmm. It just expands as we go through the Scripture. But back to that first baptism, we didn't quite get through that. Here's a Scripture that uh, I looked up, uh, Galatians 3.27. People are confused about this. I mean, really confused about it. So we've talked about the laying on of hands, and uh, when they laid hands on the Old Testament there, uh in symbolism, the sins were put on the animal, but the animal had to die. Right. Just like Christ had to die as a human mm -hmm. being, sinless on the cross. So it all pointed to Him. But now back to the three baptisms again. This first one, I want to read that, Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay. Into Christ, <laughs> not into water. And not in, not in the spirit, into the spirit, or with the spirit. Even right. though you received the Holy Spirit at at the new birth, you do. Yeah, but not filled. Right, you're not filled. Well, why do we need to be filled? Well, that's the third baptism. Uh, God doesn't do stuff just to be doing. There's a reason. Exactly. There's a reason for it. So it's impossible to, to to baptize a sinner into Christ with water. Yeah, it's. Uh... Uh, but a lot of people misinterpret this mm -hmm. and think that it's about mm -hmm. water baptism. And it isn't. And, and then that leads to the false mm -hmm. doctrine of, well, the water baptism saves you. Yeah, and then we get off into the, to this teaching that, well, I was baptized into the church. Uh, the church is not Christ, everybody. Exactly. See, we've got to deal with this. And mm -hmm. nobody's dealing with it I know of. I mean, there's a few. Thank God for them. But... We're just a little church here on the wrong side of the railroad track, okay? But we know what we're talking about. Yeah. And yet it seems like people don't want to hear it. Well, 
I guess we're in good company. <laughs> I guess the next will be hauling us off to jail. I don't know. So, back to Mark 16. Uh, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, let me dwell on that just a minute. Men's we're almost through anyway. People think that's water. It's not water. It's <laughs> baptized in the Christ. That's what saves you. <laughs> I know. But for years, I, I understood that as water. And now, don't misunderstand me. If we teach it as water, we need to explain these three baptisms so we can understand. Mm -hmm. uh, but even if it was water baptism, the emphasis is not on baptism. The emphasis is on believing. Right. Look at it again. Then. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not doesn't say well, not Where's baptized. the baptism? Yeah. It's, so the emphasis is on the believing or the not believing. That's exactly right, and that is faith. Mm-hmm. But how will they hear until the truth comes? And then they, they have to accept it. And that's, that's the believing principle we're talking about. Right. Which is the doctrine of Christ in manifestation. People need that. Everybody say, I need that tonight. I need that. Right. We all need it. Because, and it's continual. The same message, maybe in a, a different viewpoint or expanded, whatever, is still the truth. Yeah. You can't exhaust the truth. No. It's infinite. Okay. So then, um, the last part of uh, the second verse. Okay, let's talk a minute about the resurrection of the dead. Now, the way I understand this, uh, the Old Testament, they didn't understand exactly what we have access to. Now, it's been a progressive uh, revelation. Yeah. Starting back yeah. in Genesis, and each prophet's mm -hmm. given a little more revelation, mm -hmm. and and uh, they then build upon the yeah, and then we're given mm -hmm. more revelation. You know, John the Revelator, he mm -hmm. gave us more information about the about the resurrection. Yeah. So when people pass away as a pastor, uh, if they're a Christian, and the authority of Christ, we we commit their body back to the earth, in hopes of the resurrection. From the dead. Now we've got to get that. Mm -hmm. Not of the dead. Mm -hmm. So explain the two different resurrections that is taught in the scripture for us tonight. There's two different resurrections. Two main ones. Right. Uh, they're called the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Mm -hmm. um, uh, called by several other names, but, but mainly the, the, uh, those that are born again and mm -hmm. those that are not born again. It's two different resurrections. Mm -hmm. And we learn in the revelation of John that uh, there's going to be a thousand years between those two re re uh, yeah. resurrections. Which is the millennium, yes. And right. So the, the, uh, all the righteous are going to be resurrected at the same time that the rapture happens. Because that will take uh, place uh, pre-trib. Pre-trib. <laughs> We get off into heresy there, and the church is, <laughs> runs wild with that one, I tell you. But and go ahead. all of the uh, unrighteous will be resurrected then at the end of the millennium and appear mm -hmm. before the great white throne. To judgment. be judged. Yeah. Which brings us into the last foundational teaching here in just a minute. So let's go back a minute now. So when a Christian physically dies, they will be resurrected from the dead. Yep. Or from among the dead. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. But the resurrection of the dead includes everyone after the millennium, and they're not Christians. Right. They didn't die in the faith. They were lost or backslid to the point of no return. Right. And they're going to be judged, and there'll be no uh, redemption. Sadly, that's true. And it'll be the lake of fire. Yep. Where Satan, fallen angels, demons, and sad to say, human beings will go. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's part of the message of the gospel. Uh, so the way we see it then, the Bible teaches us that Jesus will be our Savior and Lord now, or later he will be the judge. Mm -hmm. All judgment has been given to his hand. He will decide who goes up to the man upstairs, the good Lord, as people say, or who goes down. Yeah. Now, Satan is not in hell. 
I don't know yeah. where this false doctrine comes from, do you? No, they have him having a kingdom <laughs> in hell with the throne and everything. Yeah. And, and, <clears throat> you know. He's never been there. No. So I don't know where they get this he, stuff. He I roams mean. to and fro on the earth and... and mm -hmm. Goes into and, heaven and accuses the brethren. Yeah, and Job, yeah. we learn that he can go up to heaven and accuse mm -hmm. the brethren. And he's called the accuser of the yeah. brethren. Uh, so, yeah, he's not He's mm -hmm. not in hell. He's not got a throne in hell. Hell is not no. his kingdom. Hell is his no. punishment, not his kingdom. Yeah, and he's not there yet. No, not yet. Uh, no hope of redemption for any of the fallen beings that God created before Adam and Eve. No. no. They're all going to hell. And they know it. Yeah. What breaks the heart of God is that His prized creation, man, whom Jesus came to pay the price for eternal life, which He did, if mankind, including the feminine gender, does not accept Christ as Savior and Lord, God has no choice but to judge them. Mm -hmm. And there's only one way to be saved. One way. And that is faith in Christ alone. Yep. What He did on the cross death, burial, resurrection, sin of the Holy Spirit, pardon available to anyone that will accept the forgiveness of sins. You know, it's not why would a loving God send someone to hell. It's why would, why would a sensible man reject salvation? Well, I know. I'm beginning to wonder that there's more demon possession than we think. What holds a person back? What holds you back that's watching from committing 100% to the Lord Jesus Christ? What holds you back? Well, I'm not ready. You better get ready. Take a look at this world. Well, they've been saying that for years. Yeah, but we're years closer now. Yeah. I don't think we've got much time left. It depends on what the church does. It depends on what the church does. If the church will repent and get back in the gospel, we may have some years left. Could be. If not, there's going to be a separation. So the last phrase then is eternal judgment, and we've been talking about that, eternal judgment. What is eternity? Eternal judgment. You know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people think, well, eternity is just time going on forever. But I think eternity time? is something mm. outside of time. I mean, God, time, God yeah. dwells in eternity, mm. and He created time. So time is something inside of eternity. It, it, you know, eternity is mm -hmm. outside beyond time. If God was in time, He'd be bound to time like we are. Mm -hmm. But He's not. No, He's not. I made a statement uh, to Brother Heath the other day uh, that because God is eternal being, um, He's infinite, uh, no beginning or end. So, He's everywhere present at the same time, isn't that right? Yeah. That means he's everywhere present in the time realm. Yeah. Or not. It doesn't matter. So the point I'm making is because God is not bound to time and yesterday is like the present tense with us, a thousand years, strike that, two thousand years is like the present tense with God. So when a, when a sinner repents and receives Jesus, it's like, Jesus is dying at 3 p.m. today. You follow me? Mm -hmm. In the mind of God, it's now. Today is the day of salvation. So when a person's filled with the Holy Spirit, it's like, oh, the Holy Spirit just came on the day of Pentecost. And wow, it's like time doesn't mean anything. No. If we can grasp this. And so it's relevant. God's present now, but He's also present everywhere past, present, and future at the same time. Yeah, time only means something to us. It doesn't, yeah. God's outside of it. But He came down in the time to show us mm -hmm. what He wanted. And He provided everything that we need to move, to shift into eternity. Now, eternity has no end. I can understand mm -hmm. a beginning, but no beginning or no end, I don't understand that. But I know that it's right. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, the question is, you that are watching, have you given your life to Christ so that you can receive eternal life? And actually, we receive that when we believe on Jesus, don't yeah. we? Yeah. 
Yeah, when when we get born again, our judgment's passed. Just like right that, then. yeah. Jesus bore the judgment. Yeah. So we're we're born again and and uh, receive eternal life at the very m minute or second that we believe. Yeah. But not so for the sinner. No, they haven't believed. So, and if they die in that condition, they're not going to make it. No. And they'll say, "Well, you're judging." Well, no, the Bible says that you got to receive Christ in order to be saved. And uh, so if you haven't done that, listening to us out there, we've talked a little bit about this doctrine of Christ. You need to accept Christ and get in His doctrine, which is His teachings that deal with eternal things, eternal matters. And it's really easy to do that. Uh, you need to pray the sinner's prayer, or you need to recommit yourself to Christ. I call it a prayer of recommittal. And, uh, you know, most people that are watching, uh, they don't pray along with you. But you know what? The Word of God finds a lodging place, and uh, it'll not return void. Right. It'll produce what God sends it to do. So we just sow. We just uh, share some truths, and it's endless. But then your spirit will pick up on these things, and uh, it'll have an effect on people. Amen. That's how we came into Christ. Is it had an effect on us, right? Right. It draws you into Him some yeah. way. It's supernatural, really. Difficult to explain, but then it, it's real. It, you know, the Word of God, it, it's a mirror to show us our shortcomings, and then it, but it doesn't just leave it there. It draws us to the solution, to Jesus Christ. Amen. It draws us into repentance mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. accepting Him as Savior. Yeah. It draws us into that new life. That's right. So, uh, Billy, we put up a uh, email address, yours, please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you have questions or you need to find a good church uh, where you live, uh, we might be able to recommend one. It, it's scarce, but we, I think we can find some for you. And uh, you need to make sure you're right with God. And I think that we need to... Uh, Trust the Lord to, to deal with people that are listening to me right now and listening to us this last 30, 40 minutes. And uh, you need to make a change. So what is repentance? You know, the Bible says repent or you perish. Well, it's, its simplest definition is to turn around. Turn around. Turn around. You've been going down a, the mm -hmm. path you've been on mm -hmm. when you see in the Word that that that's wrong, you turn around, head back to God. So it's 180 degrees back this way. Yeah. See where we're going away from God. And the sad fact of it is, people are the same. It's got to get down to where there's no hope left, right? It's Miserable. Sad, but a lot of people mm -hmm. wait until the mm -hmm. very last, until hope's all but gone, until their life's all but gone before they. Wait, yeah. Before they then they decide to turn around and give yeah. their life to Christ. But I remind us all, today's the day of salvation. Now is accepted time. We're not promised tomorrow. And if you die before you reach that low point, no. then you don't make it. So let's not gamble with eternal life. What do you say? You know, saying that little prayer won't save you, but if you believe the good news, which is Christ died in our place. He was our sacrifice. God gave a sacrifice for us because we messed yeah. it up. It's that simple. And then there'll be a change. It's called conversion. And you'll, your eyes will be opened. You'll, you will have the ability to know God through your spirit, not intellectualism. That's what people need. That's what's wrong. That's why we're having the riots in this country. That's why we're, uh, people are killing and stealing and uh, all types of evil. It's because their heart's not right with God. That's what it is. Yep. And Satan moves in for the kill. Mm -hmm. Sad to say. We need to have a turnaround in this country and the church especially. The only way to do that is one soul at a time, not a group thing. It's one right. soul at a time. So if you need the Lord out there, I invite you to say this prayer in your heart. Maybe you're in, in a bed. You know, I see somebody laying in a sick bed. And uh, I don't even know if you can talk. But uh, if you can say in your spirit like a, a silent prayer, you know what I mean? Silent yep. prayer. God will hear that. He will. And He'll answer. Yes, He will. And uh, if you accept Christ like the thief did on the cross, 
uh, you go to heaven should you physically expire. That's the deal. Father, I pray for that person that's laying on the bed, and uh, I ask you to give him grace. It's a man. I ask you to give him grace and to help him pray this prayer in faith that will save his soul. And say this in your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. You died on the cross for my sins. You rose again for my justification. I ask you to forgive my sins. Cleanse me with the precious blood you shed on the cross. I receive you as my Savior and Lord. I am yours, and I know by grace I will be saved through faith. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give my life to Christ. And I do right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. If that person's out there and you are, get a message to us some way. We'd like to hear from you.